feels to be in a room, brothers and sisters, exalting your name, uh, where we can spend an, an hour 15 and forget about ourselves and fix our sights together on you and your glory. My prayer is that 40 minutes from now, you are bigger to us than you are right now. You are more ravishing, more irresistible to us 40 minutes from now than you are right now. May we see you from some brand new angles that just draw us to our knees in deeper worship. And I pray that as a result, we walk out of here this morning and we just cannot shut up about you. We are so filled to the brim with your presence, so in, in awe of who you are that that we almost become obnoxious to, <laughs> to co-workers and family and, and friends and neighbors um, because we are just oozing Jesus constantly. Um, so Holy Spirit, would you make that happen in this time in your word? We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right, well, it is a joy to be back. I was here two weeks ago for part one of a little mini-series called Becoming a missionary on the closest mission field to you, your own heart. And two weeks ago, just to do a quick recap, I talked about the fact that we are all already evangelists for whatever you're enjoying. Right? Think about this show. you got to see this on Netflix. It's so good. It'll blow your mind. Uh, two weeks ago, I was an evangelist for the movie First Man. Uh, the Neil Armstrong story that my wife had seen a, a couple nights before, and it was just so good uh, that we can't shut up about it. Uh, you got to try this restaurant. It's unbelievable. you got to try this steakhouse. It's their bone-in ribeye will blow your mind, right? If you enjoy something, you want other people in on the excitement. And so I posed a question in here two weeks ago. How many of us wished we shared the gospel more than we actually do. Yeah, every hand's up in the air. My hand is way up in the air. And so I believe that the secret to that is enjoying Jesus so much that you can't shut up about him. And the secret to that is preaching the gospel to ourselves every single day. And so two weeks ago, we looked at three ways not to do that. We looked at three heresies, three bad ideas about what happened on the cross. If you recall, we talked about uh, Origen's ransom theory, which said that Jesus died on the cross to pay off the devil. We looked at all kinds of problems with that. We looked at Abelard's moral influence theory, the idea that Jesus just died because I asked God how much he loved me, and he spread out his arms and said this much and died. So the cross is just about the expression of God's love. And we saw the problem with that is that the cross is, yes, 100% the expression of God's perfect, infinite, boundless love, but it is simultaneously the expression of God's infinite justice against sin. We looked at a third way to get the cross wrong, which was uh, what I called Leo X, Pope Leo X's penance theory of the cross, which was that the cross of Jesus isn't quite enough to get you all the way saved. You have to supplement it by whether it's praying the rosary, whether it's buying an indulgence, uh, whether it's practicing all these different acts of penance to prove, God, is this enough? God, do I merit your love now? Am I worthy of salvation? We saw that that, at the end of the day, is a false gospel because Jesus is all the righteousness. He is all the perfection. He is all the worthiness you and I will ever need. Amen? So that was three ways to get the cross wrong. This morning, we're going to look at six ways to get the cross right. Uh, six ways straight from the scriptures uh, to get the cross work of Jesus right so that we can become better evangelists to our own heart. And I'm going to walk you through the ABCs of the cross. If you look in your bulletin, they're all spelled out on the back side of that page. There's a handy little graphic there for you. And I want to challenge you this week, run a little experiment preach through the A, B, C, D, E, F, maybe carve out five minutes a day. Uh, some days it takes me 60 seconds. I'll just be driving on my commute, and 60 seconds I'll run through the A, B, C, D, E, Fs, and I can tell you from experience, I've been doing this for about three years now, it makes a huge difference. It makes evangelism less like pulling teeth and something more spontaneous because I'm enjoying God that much more. 
Now, before we get into the ABCs, let me ask a personal question. And this is a safe place. You're with trusted brothers and sisters. You can be honest. We can be real with each other. How many of you, by a show of hands, talk to yourselves? <laughs> Look around. See, you're not as crazy as you thought you were. Uh, we all uh, talk to ourselves, and that's a good thing. All right, there's kind of, a, kind of a stereotype, talking to yourself, uh, you must be crazy. Well, biblically, self-talk is the mark of spiritual sanity. Read the Psalms. Think of how many times the psalmist says things like, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What's David doing? He's talking to himself, right? He's not saying, why so downcast, God? Put your hope in God. He's saying, why so downcast, O my soul, put your hope in God. And so a mark of spiritual maturity, a mark of spiritual sanity, is getting good at preaching to ourselves. And so the A, B, C, D, E, F we're about to go through is a way of giving content, a soundtrack in your head to play so that we can preach scripture to ourselves on a daily basis. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Uh, the A in the ABCs of the cross stands for atoner. And the big idea here, I was hostile to God, but Jesus has made me at one with him, breaking down the wall of division and welcoming me into friendship. Let me just take one step backwards to, to set a context for us here. When we talk about the cross, what we're really talking about is what you might think of as a giant diamond. Like a giant diamond is multifaceted, right? You can step around it and see the light reflect in, in different angles. You get beauty from walking 360 degrees around it. And this comes from uh, one of my all-time favorite theologians, uh, he's a, a Dutch theologian. Do we have any Dutchmen here? Any Dutch folks? All right, I see those hands. God bless you. Uh, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. At least that's what my wife tells me, because she's Dutch. Which is sort of offensive, because I'm Czechoslovakian and Italian, but I forgive her. Uh, here's what the great Dutch theologian uh, Herman Bavink has to say about the cross. He says, the work of Christ is so, I love this word, multifaceted. The work of Christ is so multifaceted that it cannot be captured in a single word or summarized in a single formula. So in the different books of the New Testament, we get different meanings of the death of Christ that are highlighted. And all of them together help give us a deep impression and a clear sense of the riches and many-sidedness of the mediator's work. I love Bobbing's language there because he makes the cross sound like this multifaceted diamond. And so, again, we're just going to take one lap around that diamond this morning. So we see the A, Jesus is our atoner. Uh, you see this crystal clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 has this to say. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage. Let me just unpack a few things. We often hear the gospel as, well, Jesus died for your sin. Is that true? 100%. Praise God. But in a way, it's sort of a half-truth. Because Jesus didn't just go to the cross to become sin on your behalf, to take the full brunt of divine wrath that you and I deserve, all that justice. He did take our sin, but on the flip side... He credits to you all of his perfection. All of his righteousness becomes yours. Let, let me say it like this. Why did there have to be a gap between the first Christmas and Good Friday? Think about it. Why couldn't Jesus have just been born that first Christmas and then a few days later been executed for our sins? Why the gap between the first Christmas and the first Good Friday and the first Easter? Because he had to live a couple decades fully human 
subjected to all the same temptations we are, and obey all 613 of God's perfect commandments perfectly. So he lived the perfect life. You and I don't. We're a far cry from that. So that by the time he gets to the cross, he's not just taking your sin, he's giving you all that perfection in its place. And that's how sinners like us get reconciled to God. Now, it's important to grasp that point that when Jesus decides to do that for you, take your sin and credit to you his righteousness, it's not like you and I were basically good people. It's not like we had it together and God was looking down from heaven and said, wow, they're impressive. Look at how spiritual. Look, at they did a quiet time. They went to Riverview. They were on time to Riverview. They, they read their Bible on their Bible app this week. I am so dazzled, so blown away by their holiness, I think I'll die for them and spend eternity with them. Not even close. When... God chose you when God chose me we were in the language of Ephesians 2 dead lifeless flatlined corpses we couldn't wiggle a pinky towards God and that's when he chose us and so Paul describes this in the book of Romans uh, he says we were hostile to God he says in Romans 8 that we were at enmity with God when he chose us. And so when we talk about Jesus as our atoner, what he's accomplishing on the cross is turning God's enemies into God's friends. And I think there's a, a powerful image for this from the pen of one of my favorite authors. Has anybody here ever read uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov? Anyone? All right, I'm a professor, so you get extra credit, extra credit, extra credit right there. Uh, it is hailed by literary critics. Uh, many of them consider it the greatest novel ever written. Uh, and I'm inclined to agree with that. Well, in the greatest novel ever written, there is what is hailed as the greatest chapter of the greatest novel ever written, a chapter known as the Grand Inquisitor. And so let me give you just kind of the Cliff Notes version, the 60-second version of the greatest chapter in the greatest novel. The story... Uh, the chapter unfolds as a conversation between two brothers. Ivan Karamazov is a mean atheist. He's talking to his little brother, Alyosha. Alyosha is a devout Christian. He's got a deep faith. And so the whole chapter is big brother Ivan trying to make fun of little brother Alyosha's Christianity. And to do that, Ivan tells this story, this fictional account of the Grand Inquisitor. He says, Alyosha, come here, brother. Let me tell you how silly your Jesus is. Pretend with me that Jesus returns to Spain in the 15th century. Jesus shows up. He's walking the streets of Sevilla, Spain, and he's spreading his infinite compassion. He's touching and healing people. He's spreading his love all throughout the city. And that ticks off the inquisitors of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. And so they arrest Jesus. And so the bulk of this chapter is now Jesus, who's just called the prisoner. He's in his jail cell, and the inquisitor of the Catholic Church comes in, and for 20 pages is just blasting Jesus, mocking Jesus, just ruthless, relentless, a full-on verbal assault, making fun of Jesus. And at the end of Ivan's story, Dostoevsky writes this. The prisoner, that's Jesus, had listened intently all the time, looking gently in the Inquisitor's face, and evidently not wishing to reply. The old man longed for him to say something, however bitter and terrible, but he, Jesus, the prisoner, suddenly approached the old man in silence, softly kissed him on his bloodless, aged lips. That was all his answer. Now, why is Ivan telling that story? Again, he's trying to show his little brother Alyosha just how weak, just how pathetic his Jesus really is. So Ivan's been, uh, Alyosha's been sitting through this attack on his belief in Jesus for 20 pages. Take a guess what Alyosha does. 
of my favorite parts of the whole book. Gets up, walks over, gives Big Brother a kiss. He embodies the love of Jesus and says, that's not weak, that's love. That's how love can overcome evil. And so I think there's a powerful image there for us to understand what the scriptures mean by atonement. You and I were the grand inquisitor. You and I mocked our creator relentlessly. And when he could have returned our mockery with just wrath, what does he do? Instead, he gives us the kiss of life. Jesus is our atoner. That leads us to a second way to preach the gospel to yourself. Jesus is not only our atoner, he's also our battlefield hero. And the big idea here is that the forces of fear and evil held us in their oppressive grip. But Jesus, the warrior king, has crushed the enemy's head and claimed victory. So there's a second biblical image for what's going on on the cross. And all this goes back to the very first time in Scripture that we hear the gospel. Do we have any Bible thumpers, any theology nerds here who can tell me when the first time we hear the gospel in all of Scripture, and Mel, you can't answer. First time you hear the gospel in all of Scripture, help me out. Yes, Genesis 3, you know the verse? 15, that's amazing. If you were in my theology class, automatic A right there. Genesis 3.15, uh, theology nerds like me call this the proto evangelium the first time you hear the good news in all of Scripture. And so Adam and Eve have just messed everything up. They just disobeyed. They just threw the universe into catastrophe by disobeying. And right in the middle of that, God shows up and makes this promise. He says, a seed of woman will be born who will crush the snake's head. And in crushing the snake's head, it will bruise his heel. So we get this sort of cryptic statement about redemptive suffering. There's going to be a human, the seed of woman, who will bruise his heel, but in doing that, he's crushing the head of the snake. He's crushing the serpent. He's crushing Satan. And so later on in Scripture, that serpent is described as a vicious dragon, a devouring lion, a murderous thief, uh, a polyon, which means the destroyer. And so according to 1 John 3, 8, Jesus shows up to destroy the works of the devil. That is to crush the serpent. On the cross, Jesus slayed the dragon. He hunted the lion. He caught the thief. He destroyed the destroyer. Paul tells us uh, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, this is the language of uh, first century battles. So if you're a soldier in a Roman army, and you go to war against whoever, and you win the battle, it was common to shackle the fallen soldiers of the losing side. You would shackle them together by the ankles, and pull a chain, and you would lead them on a public shame march through the center of town. So everybody could mock them, everybody could spit at them, everybody could know they're the losers. That was super common in the first century Roman Empire. So Paul, in Colossians 2, picks up on that to say that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. On the cross, Jesus was leading Satan and his minions on a public shame march through the entire universe to show Satan and his forces to be a defeated enemy. Isn't that good news? Th think about that, that the enemy of your soul, the most malevolent being who would love nothing more than to tear you to shreds, has been crushed by Lord Jesus. Amen? All right, that leads us to the C. So help me out. We've seen that Jesus is A, our we could do better than that, Riverview. Jesus is A, a toner. Jesus is B, battlefield hero. And Jesus is C, our chain breaker. I was a slave, a slave to darkness, to selfishness, to anxiety. But Jesus is my great liberator who purchased my freedom and cut my chains. You see this in lots of verses. Let me just quickly highlight two. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, 
Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Romans 8, or excuse me, John chapter 8, verses 34 and 36. Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, you guys probably know this verse. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, the kind of slavery that's described in these passages isn't the way we typically think of slavery. We think of slavery as somebody being chained against their will. What Jesus is getting at here in John 8 isn't slavery against your will. It is slavery by your will. You are enslaved by your own sinful desires. And so part of what Jesus, and this is all the language of the first century slave markets here, part of what Jesus is doing as our redeemer, as our liberator, is freeing us from ourselves. He's freeing us from ourselves. This struck me way back in high school, you know, 50 years ago when I was in high school. Uh, I had a friend, Mike, and I was the kind of brand new baby Christian, I got saved at 14 years old, uh, that I just could not shut up about Jesus. So I played high school football and I'd be standing on the sideline because um, I wasn't very good, so I spent most of my time on the sideline. And I would just make my way player by player and made sure that by the end of every game, uh, everybody had heard the gospel yet again. It's probably super obnoxious, but I didn't care. Uh, and so I would share the gospel, and, and one of my uh, teammates, Mike, said something that, that stuck with me all these years. I'm telling him the good news of the cross, and Mike tells me, you know, Thad, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. I would rather, rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And when he said it, it just, I was taken back, like, man, that's, that's a heck of a thing to say. And Mike's point was, this whole Jesus thing means I have to be a slave to Jesus. I have to call him Lord. No, thank you. I'm going to be captain of my own soul. I'm going to be king of my own little kingdom. I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to call the shots. The buck stops with me. So he thought that was freedom. It didn't hit me until years later why Mike was so wrong. Uh, I was listening to the great troubadour, the great folk and rock icon, Bob Dylan. Any Dylan fans in the house? All right, I love it. Uh, so Dylan sang his famous song off the Slow Train Coming album, You're Gonna Have to Serve Somebody, right? with that great line, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve. The freedom that Mike thought he could have as his own Lord is an illusion. You're on your knees to someone, Jesus or the devil. So as the great Bob Dylan saying, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. It's my, uh, my little Bob Dylan impersonation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to zoom. All right, so, so he's, he's on to something there, that we're all slaves to someone. It's only that one form of slavery, slavery to King Jesus, is true freedom. So Jesus is our chain breaker. This leads us to the D in our acrostic. So Jesus is A, R. He is B, R. He is C, R. And he is DR, defense attorney. So we've moved from the language of the city, the language of the battlefield, uh, the language of the slave market. We move now to the language of the courtroom. It's just another angle that, of this beautiful diamond to get out what's really happening on the cross. The big idea here is we broke the laws of an infinitely just being. But Jesus took our death sentence and now pleads the winning case for our innocence. Romans 3, verses 23 to 27 says this. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified, that's a legal term, it's a not guilty sentence. We get a not guilty sentence by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus 
whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that God might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith, of the one who trusts in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It's excluded. There's no boasting because all of our salvation, our not guilty sentence, is 110% thanks to Jesus. Now let me just zoom out for a second and put this in a bigger context. You might think, well, here I am in a room with a bunch of Christians, and we're the kind of folks who care about getting right with God. We're the kind of folks who care about um, justification, getting a not guilty sentence, being clean, being pure. And that's just kind of a quirk of the Christian subculture. Let, let me push back on that for a second. I want you to think with me for a second. Imagine a devout Hindu plunging into the flowing waters of the Ganges. What is that Hindu trying to do? What is that Hindu seeking? They're seeking purification. They're seeking to be not guilty. They're seeking to wash away all their bad karma. Picture with me for a second a Muslim who's bowing down towards Mecca five times a day to practice Salat, their, their five daily prayers. What is that Muslim seeking? They're seeking justification. They're seeking to work off their sins. They're seeking to be holy in the eyes of Allah. Picture the Orthodox Jew standing at the, the wailing wall in Jerusalem, crying out to Yahweh, wailing. What are they doing? They're trying to be holy. They're trying to be justified. They're trying to be righteous in the eyes of a holy God. Let, let me give you another example that might be unexpected. Think of the atheist who takes to social media to, say, blast Republicans for all their bigotry and all their homophobia and all their racism, and go, hops on there every day to, to write these, these diatribes and to troll different comment sections, to, to call people names who he disagrees with politically. What is that person trying to do? Same thing the Jews doing at the Wailing Wall. Same thing the Muslims doing facing Mecca. The same thing the Hindus doing jumping into the Ganges. They're trying to feel like a good person. Trying to feel like they're on the right side of history. They're trying to find what scripture calls justification. Everybody on planet earth seeks the not guilty sentence. But it's only in Christ and Christ alone that we find real justification. Every Jehovah's Witness knocking on doors, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make it into the kingdom. How will I ever know if I've knocked on enough doors? The, the Mormon keeping the rules and, and staying away from caffeine and going to church and doing all the things, what are they trying to do? They're trying to earn their way. They're standing in the celestial kingdom. We're all seeking justification. And so think of that as you share the gospel with friends and family and neighbors and coworkers that... Everybody you talk to has that same soul deep need to feel clean. And brothers and sisters, you have access to the best news in the universe, the only way to actually be clean through the blood of Jesus. And so we need to preach that to ourselves every single day. And here's a, a helpful verse to be able to do that. Uh, 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you. Uh, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's a lot going on here. I just want to zoom in on one word. Many of you have heard me unpack this word before, but it's so good. I got to do it again. Uh, it says, when we sin, Jesus is our, the ESV I just read says, advocate. Um, some translations will say uh, intercessor. I think the best translation of the Greek here is defense attorney. Uh, this is, again, the language of first century courtrooms. 
And so if you commit a crime, you would need what the Greek word parakletos is getting at. Uh, so help me out here. What does that prefix para mean? Anyone? It means beside or alongside. So there's para. Uh, anybody remember from any of my messages in the past what kletos means? Anyone for massive extra credit points? An automatic A in my theology class? Uh, kletos means elbow. So a parakletos is someone who comes alongside you at the elbow and pleads your not guilty sentence. So think of it this way. Let's imagine, uh, let me pick on Mel for a second. So Pastor Mel, uh, he's sitting there and he's just kind of scratching his head like, man, I thought Thad was a lot better preacher. This is just, this is just bad. Uh, and, and so he sneaks away between services and, and finds my car down in the lot and pulls out a key and carves into the door, preach better, <laughs> and then, you know, stabs a couple of my tires. So now he's got some explaining to do, right? Now justice has to be served. I need a new paint job. I need that buffered out. Uh, I'm going to need some new tires. And so now he stands guilty. So what does Pastor Mel need? He needs somebody to para. So I come alongside him. And he needs someone to come alongside him at the elbow and plead for his not guilty sentence. He needs a defense attorney. And so after the service, I'm going to go down and check my car and make sure. So Jesus, use that mental image. When, not if, when you sin, you have, according to 1 John chapter 2, Jesus right beside you at your elbow pleading on your behalf for your justification. You have literally the best defense attorney in the history of the universe arguing your case. And the truth is, he always wins. He has yet to lose a single case. Why? Because he has a knockdown, drag out argument, his own shed blood on your behalf. So picture that next time that you feel like, oh, I just got to say sorry a million times to Jesus, and I just got to prove how sorry I am, and I got to make all these outlandish promises. Quit being your own defense attorney. Jesus is way, way, way better at it. Jesus is our A, he's our B, he's our C, he's our D, and he's our E. I was unclean, but Jesus became my spotless lamb and serves as my priest so I can stand confidently in the presence of divine perfection. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, if that sanctifies, if that holifies us for the purification of the flesh, then how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we move now from the city, from the courtrooms, from the battlefields, we move here into the temple to see the cross from another angle. And so to understand what happened in the Old Testament at the temple, there's, there's three big rituals that really make sense of this passage. Uh, the first, if we were to hop in our time machine and go 88 miles an hour and hang out in ancient Israel, we would find purification offerings. And the way that worked, a purification offering, the, the Jewish priest would lay his hands on a bull, a goat, a lamb, or a bird, and that was kind of a symbolic transfer of impurity. And then he would slay the animal to bring forgiveness to himself and the people. That was a purification offering. Second kind of offering that went on at the temple. 
once a year was the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement involved two goats. Uh, the first goat would be killed by the priest, and then its blood would be sprinkled in the Holy of Holies first, and then in the tent, uh, and then the altar. And it was, this kind, it was considered like a detergent. It would, it would purify everything um, so that people could stand before God again. The second goat, you guys have probably heard of the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, the priest would lay his hands on this poor animal, and that was, again, a symbolic transfer of the collective sin and evil and injustice of the Israelites. And then that goat was just cut loose. It was kicked out of the camp, kicked out of the city to just wander and drop dead in the wilderness. And so that was the Day of Atonement uh, offerings. A third one, you had the Pascal offering or the Passover offering, and that's where they had to find a lamb, a perfect lamb without blemish. They would kill it at twilight. They would have a big meal, eat the meat, uh, and its blood would be painted over the doorposts so that, as Scripture says, no plague will befall to destroy you. And so in all of those sacrifices, we see foreshadowings that are all pointing in the same direction. Jesus is the Pascal lamb. Jesus is uh, the goats from the Day of Atonement. He is our scapegoat. Uh, Jesus is the bull, the goat, the lamb, the bird from the purification offering. He is all that for us so that you and I can now stand confidently in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. And so think of it this way. In Isaiah 6, there's that famous scene. Jesus is, uh, uh, Isaiah is standing in the throne room of God. He sees the the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. The whole place fills up with smoke. The thresholds are shaking. The seraphim are circling God's throne. And what are the seraphim saying? Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. And that's the triple emphasis in Hebrew, which is the angel's way of saying God is holiest. He's holy in all caps, in bold font, italicized with exclamation points and underlined. God is the superlative holiest being in existence. And what is Isaiah's response to standing in the presence of supreme holiness? Does he feel good about himself? Does he feel like pretty big? Like, I got this. Like, hey, how's it going, God? No. He says, woe, woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. He feels unraveled. He feels like he's about to spontaneously combust. And so think about that. Picture yourself in that throne room. Would you feel all high and mighty? Would you feel great about yourself? Would you feel confident? You should, because you're standing there thanks to Jesus. You are standing there dressed in his righteousness so you can stand confidently in the presence of absolute holiness. Amen? Let's hit our final letter as we wind down. Jesus is not only our atoner, our battlefield hero, our chain breaker, our defense attorney, our eternal priest. Jesus is also our... I was left to die at the human dump, but Jesus became forsaken in my place so I can enjoy adoption as a cherished son or daughter of God. And so jumping to the Old Testament real quickly... There's this running theme of outside the camp. Remember, the scapegoat had to be kicked outside the camp. Uh, if you were ceremonially unclean, you had to be kicked outside the camp. And so being in the camp meant I'm connected, I'm wanted, I'm part of family, I'm connected to God, I'm in the covenant people. But to be outside the camp was to be unwanted, it was to be a misfit, it was to be an outcast, it was to be unloved, good for nothing but the grave. That's a running theme all through the Old Testament. And so when we get to the New Testament, it picks up on this. Hebrews 13, verses 11 to 13 says, The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned, here's the words, outside the camp. Verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So Jesus became the forsaken son. He was kicked outside the camp, right? Skull Hill, Golgotha, where the crucifixion happened, was outside the gates of Jerusalem. He was crucified outside. He became the outcast so we could be brought into the city, so we could be brought into God's family. And I'll, I'll close on this point from uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. She says it better than I could. 
She says, Jesus willingly chose isolation so that you might never be alone in your hurt and sorrow. He had no real fellowship so that fellowship might be yours this moment. You will never experience isolation or abandonment or dread of being forsaken as did your Lord. Fellowship is ours. And we have it because he didn't. And closing passage, then I'll pray and and get out of here. Ephesians 1, longest run-on sentence in Scripture, 204 words in the original Greek before Paul just pauses to take a breath. And the whole thing is about the gospel, the good news. And he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's called us to be holy and, many of you have heard me unpack this word before, blameless, or some translations have it, unblemished. And this is the language, not of the courtroom, not of the slave market. Uh, This is the language of the human dumps that existed in the Roman Empire human dumps, literally where unwanted babies were tossed away like garbage. And those unwanted babies were called, in Greek, the momos, which means unwanted, blemished. And so when Paul's writing to Ephesus, which had a huge human dump right outside its gate, outside the camp, many of the first people to ever read Paul's words in Ephesians 1 would have been the outcasts would have been unwanted, would have been tossed to the curb like garbage who had then been taken into the slave trade later. So they had been abandoned by their earthly fathers, deemed unlovable, unfit for life by their earthly fathers. And Paul tells this unbelievably good news that maybe if your earthly father is a deadbeat, don't sweat it because your heavenly father, your capital F father, has renamed you from momos, blemished, to amomos, un blemished. That's your new identity, from unwanted to wanted, from uncherished to cherished, from blamed to blameless. And then he chases it with the image of adoption. Paul, in the next breath, says, you have now been adopted as sons and daughters. And adoption in the first century was irrevocable. It was an irreversible contract. Once an adopted son, always an adopted son. Once an adopted daughter, always an adopted daughter. So that's the good news to preach to yourself this morning. You have a father who has called you, pulled you out from the human dump, renamed you unblemished, renamed you wanted, made you cherished, made you an heir to his kingdom, and that is an irreversible love bond. Amen? All right, so I encourage you again, take five minutes this week, uh, every day, and just go through preaching the gospel to yourself. And as you are a missionary on the closest mission field to you, your own heart, uh, my prayer is that you find yourself preaching the gospel spontaneously to the people around you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've just taken one lap around this diamond of the cross. There's still so many beautiful rays to be seen. But I pray like I prayed at the beginning, that we now see you from some new angles that maybe we missed before, and that that just draws us into a deeper sense of worship and enjoyment for what a sufficient Savior you really are. We are so grateful for you. We celebrate as a church family this morning, as Riverview Church, we celebrate that you are our atoner who's turned us from God's enemies into God's friends. We thank you for being our battlefield hero who has crushed the serpent, the enemy of our souls, is a defeated humiliated foe. We thank you for being our chain breaker that we don't have to be enslaved to sin anymore because you've set us free. We thank you for being our defense attorney that you 